Welcome to this episode of Vegan Family Podcast. As always, I'm Eric Lindstrom, and I'm sharing the podcast today with Cheryl Leahy. And we have an unbelievably special guest today, I'm Ruby so Roth. I'm so excited about this, yes. Uh, how was your summer? Uh, it's winding down now, it's back to school. How are things going in your household? Great, great. All sorts of amazing events and getting everything back on track, back in the groove. So we'll yep. talk about all of that and hear about some amazing kids' books when we come back. It's time for Animal Outlook's Vegan Family Podcast. It's Eric C. Lindstrom and Cheryl Leahy. Yes, so here we go. Uh, summer is winding down. It's coming to an end. Kids are going back to school. Um, what day do they start in California? What kind of things have you had to do uh, gearing up for this? Well... It, summer is over for us, so uh, we had a we had a birthday party, and then uh, actually tomorrow I have to bring the school birthday materials. There's the beginning of the year getting to know you stuff to do. There's yep. all sorts of uh, beginning of school year things. We're fully in the swing. They're both yep. back at school now. What about you guys? Well, we're, um, we've had two days back-to-back of orientation slash open house meeting the teachers, which has gone great. Uh, both of our kids this year are starting at a brand new school. Uh, Cooper's starting first grade at this new school and Paisley starting kindergarten. So we're excited because it's a new school. It seems like it's um, really going to suit them well. It's a smaller school, smaller class sizes, but Cheryl, as you know, we have to sort of hit the reset button on... Um, coaxing the cafeterias into offering more vegan options. So we've got that ahead of us as well. Yeah, I, I kind of was thinking about that before the school year started. And then nobody has sort of raised the issue of what's on the menu, who's buying the food, you know, all that. I know my friends in Chicago who are going to Chicago public schools. They actually give them the food for free, which yeah, I feel... Wow is even worse than <laughs> having to pay for it because it's, a, you know, how can you compete with free? Yeah. You know, so I think the activism around trying to get vegan options is almost more important when that's happening where, you know, bringing lunch is just as good as having to bring yeah. money to school. Yeah. Well, we've had, you know, you can look in the archives on the vegan family podcast. We've of course talked quite a bit about packing school lunches um, healthy or otherwise, uh, just making sure that your kids have something that they'll eat at lunchtime. Um, so check out those episodes. And yeah, good luck to you. I'm very, like I said, I'm optimistic. I'm excited about this upcoming school year and um, facing, ready to face the challenges. Yeah, well, one thing that, you know, this is reminding me, when we did the orientation a couple of weeks ago for the public school, so my older one is now in public first, and they asked for volunteers for different tasks. And one of the things was teaching nutrition lessons, which it turns oh, out wow. is done through USDA. So, of course, they're going to be talking about, yep. you know, the five <laughs> no. food groups and all those things. So yep. my other vegan mom friends and I you know, are talking about how can you make this a vegan friendly lesson? Yeah, it's but I tough. will say, I mean, you know, a big challenge. generally, I still think the best way is just to bring good vegan food around them you know like i said we we had a birthday party for the younger one he just turned four um we had this amazing cake actually from the former um outreach person here at compassion over killing who's a chef an amazing chef she does all of this great stuff now and when he turned two when my now four-year-old turned two he asked for this garbage truck cake he is really into garbage trucks (laughs) <laughs> and she made in this cake that had a road on it with a caramel oil slick and it had a garbage truck made out of cake with oh at gosh. the time a two on it. And then she created all these little small garbage cans with candy in them that he could then dump in the truck. So <laughs> oh he has gosh. been talking about this cake <laughs> since he was two, yep. which I told her this is pretty impressive because it's half his life. Yeah, right. <laughs> he remembers nothing else. Yeah, he's like, remember that garbage truck cake I had when I was two? I need to have a garbage <laughs> truck party. 
So that's a great had, testimonial. So I had to get her. I mean, it's ridiculous. Like it's so it was so much work to you know do this cake. And I'll show plug her. You can order cakes from her if you're in the LA area. She's up in the valley. And uh, her name uh, her name on her website is Miss Kitchen Witch. M I S S oh, nice. Kitchen Witch, which is amazing stuff, cakes and otherwise. But uh, she made this cake for him for his fourth birthday. And then we got all this other, you know, vegan food. And that's the um, best form of activism. I think everybody was so obsessed with the cake and just loved it. And, you know, the local pizza place did vegan cheese. And actually, it was so funny, too, because he's recently been a lot more into Toy Story. So he got some gifts from family and friends that were Toy Story. So he has this whole, like, tableau of Toy Story toys now. And they're like, that sounds great. Uh, there's like a pizza planet. They have like a Buzz and Woody and there's a, a bullseye. And then he got just unrelatedly a giant T-Rex toy, which of course he's incorporated into the toy story set. So then I overhear the two kids playing with the toys and I overhear the younger ones say to infinity and be off. <laughs> and then the older <laughs> one says not to infinity and be off. It's to infinity and beyond. And yeah. so then the younger one says, <laughs> to infinity and beyond. He says, not infinity and beyond. It's beyond, like beyond meat. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's awesome. Which was just a great <laughs> vegan kid conversation. Exactly. That's how here. kids remember things. So, I well, good luck to you. Um, we'll keep each other posted. I'm sure... Uh, within a couple of episodes, we'll put together something else to help uh, the vegan families navigate their own uh, public schools and private schools and daycares and things like that um, with the challenges of foods uh, being uh, at the schools. So I am so excited about um, this week's guest or this episode's guest. I can't even tell you. Um, yeah. So, if, well, really a, a very funny side story right now. Um is that uh, my little one, um, my four-year-old, is actually home today. Uh, her kindergarten starts tomorrow. Aww. And I just sent her upstairs to get a book. Um, I told her which book I wanted her to get, and she brought it down. And guess what? It's V is for Vegan, The ABCs of Being Kind, by none other than Ruby Roth, who is this episode's special guest. I'm so excited to have her. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Ruby. Thank you. It's nice to talk to you again. Yes, yes. We uh, Ruby and I talked quite a few years ago. Um, I had an idea for an, an ABC book myself. I'm a cartoonist and I wanted to do an ABC's vegan book. And I wanted to make sure that I wasn't um, stepping on any territory that Ruby was trying to um, own with her book that had just come out at that point, V is for Vegan. And she's like, oh, not at all. We need more books. We meet, need more vegan books. So um, I'm still working on that, you know, some years later, it's a little side project, but, uh, thank you for that, for your time back then. And thank you for all you do for the animals and for your wonderful books. Thank you. Yeah. I feel like I've known you for a long time, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, it ends up that, that Ruby lives in California as that's where Cheryl's located. So they're together, um, which is also cool. Um, when we get to have an interview, we're cuddling right now. We're like cuddling yeah, around, nice. a, <laughs> around the same microphone. Mic. <laughs> but I've never so, got to, a chance to meet you in person before, uh, even though we've been big fans of your work for Thank a while. You. We have the cookbook, which we use all the time, and we you know, lend it yourself. out to non vegan families just because it's good kid food and it has cute little smiley faces and imaginative kind of recipes in there. Well, I was and telling Cheryl that that was created that way by design. It doesn't say vegan on the cover. And I wanted something that vegan families could give out to other families uh, without starting a war, without causing any conflict. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's been conflict free. And one family in particular that borrowed it for a long time and really used it a lot is very meat centric family. And they just, you know, absolutely loved it. It was awesome. And then we also so, have bees for vegan too. So. I do want to tell a real quick story because uh, it fits into a lot of my own vegan journey. Um, there's this famous Friday dinner that's hosted here in Ithaca. Um, every Friday for 21 years, a couple opens their house up uh, to up to 70 people. Literally every Friday for 20 years, they've opened their house up. T. Colin Campbell is a regular attendee and they serve vegan 
gluten-free, macrobiotic, um, you know, really good food, the stuff that I wouldn't eat normally myself. Um, but it was at one of these early dinners when I had just become vegan, so now that's coming up on eight years ago, that a couple uh, friends of ours who are, uh, you know, Sherry and, and Mike uh, Cheryl, they're both Cornell Law professors mm -hmm. and both ethical vegans, and um, they brought uh, That's Why We Don't Eat Animals. Oh. And passed it around the table as this, because their kids were young at that point, eight and six, I think, um, as just this wonderful, you know, children's book um, written by this incredible author and illustrator. And I was absolutely blown away from the beginning with uh, your style, Ruby, of writing and, of course, your style of illustration. And then most importantly, the way that you... Um, uh, for lack of a better term, don't pull punches on what you're trying to say in a lot of your yeah. books. And I love that about you. I love how you're, you're putting things out there that, um, you know, that kids should know. If you're going to talk to your kids, don't you want to tell your kids the truth? Thank you. Well, for people who may not know them, uh, my first book came out in 2009. It was called That's Why We Don't Eat Animals. This is the 10th year anniversary of that book's release. And the series that followed all of these books ended up being the first of their kind in children's literature, nonfiction titles that address the emotional lives of animals, factory farming, the environment, endangered species, all the ways that we can use our money to affect the marketplace and things like animal testing and entertainment. Um, and then came the ABC book, which is for the youngest crew. It's a funny, light, rhyming yep. um, book. And then Help Yourself Cookbook was the plant-based cookbook that I designed for everybody. And then there's a new one. Yes, which we'll talk about in one second. So I know, I mean, we obviously know what inspires you. Um, what inspires you enough to realize that you're going to launch into another book project? What, at what point do you say to yourself, well, I've got the idea, I've got the sketches. Take us through the creative process a little bit. Um, I keep a file of ideas and this new book is called Bad Day, and it was actually written a number of years ago. And I just kept adding to it, um, adding to the file as I had ideas, and it, it just kind of wrote itself. Um, I wanted, I've always wanted to do art that has a purpose beyond just self-expression. Yeah. Yeah. And so the children's books portion of my body of work really put my puts my interest together in um, you know, truth, justice, beauty, and um, artwork. And so this next book, you know, where my first books addressed physical health and the well-being of the planet and the environment and of animals, this next book is an expansion of the themes into emotional well-being. And that being said, it, it has to do with personal agency, just like all the other books do. And I feel yeah. like we live in a, an era in need of course correction and repair, and I believe that all change starts with individual. I'm not, I'm not a big proponent of fighting for legislative change. I think it's far more effective and immediate um, when change comes from people's choices. We don't. I say this in, in Vegan is Love, we don't have to wait to grow older for laws to change or for presidents to be elected. We can begin right now. Yeah. yeah. And the book is called Bad Day. And I see it comes out uh, September 10th. Is that right? But it could be pre-ordered yeah. now? Yeah. You know, Eric, since you're not here, you didn't get the special preview. I actually got to look at the book for a minute before we started talking. And I immediately said, this is so much like my four-year-old. <laughs> it reminds me so much because it's a kid having a tantrum. And that's how you sort of enter the world of of this child in the book and it's just immediate immersion. It's, it's really, it's really well done. Thank you. I can't wait to see it and pick it up myself. So Ruby, um, you know, I've heard some interviews, like having been in the movement for a long time, I've, I've been aware of your work and obviously having my own kids and everything. But I think what you just said a lot about kind of here's where you're anchoring your thinking and here are the, the core values that drive it. It sounds to me a lot like sort of, um, making central some of these kind of actions or as you say choices that you can take and being really not um not equivocating about some of these these issues and these concepts and it's very empowering to kids how do you 
um, sort of deliver that and package that for kids? How is this different than activism if you were talking to somebody who was 40, you know, when you're talking to somebody who's four? I really don't try to use any kind of childlike language. Uh, when I was teaching art at an after school program, um, I happened, I'm not tooting my own horn, but like the kids really liked me. I think had to had also to do with the fact that I'm small and I feel like they thought I was one of them. Um, but I, I think the biggest reason they liked me and, and liked hanging out and liked doing projects with me is because I spoke to them as if they were friends of mine and I didn't condescend. I didn't say, you know, that's not, you know, for you to yeah. know. Um, I didn't shut them down. There were a lot of te- these kids, you know, had a lot of them were troubled kids and I could just see the teachers just punishing them, just shutting them down when they were acting out instead of just talking to them, like, what's up, what's going on in your life right now? And so that tone was the tone that I took into the books because I actually went to look for a book that I could bring into the classroom that we could talk about veganism and, and my choices. That's how these books came about. I couldn't find anything. Um, there was a couple titles out there and they were like, a, a talking tomato or something. And it was so, it was so below the level in language that I wanted to talk to my students with. And so I just wrote it how I would, how I would say it to anybody and then, you know, change some words here and there. Um, but I, I really, it was more the imagery that I shifted. Like I, I wanted to not sugarcoat, but make it realistic, but also, yeah. manageable for a child's capacity. Like, you know, I don't believe you need to scare them all that much. Like you can have a conversation with them about what's going on in the environment and with animals and they, they jump on board pretty quickly. They need, you know, but nothing but, you know, a little gentle guidance before they're engaged with the topics. So I really just write it how I would talk to kids, which is person to person. Yeah. It sounds like you have an instinct for, kids, you know, being sort of full beings, right? I mean, it's, it's interesting to me um, to see this sort of hand-wringing among some adults about what we need to shield kids from and protect kids from, and when in reality, you know, they see the world the way they see it. It's not just, a, you know, a partially formed version of where we are. And, you know, things like, you know, scary monsters and and, you know, good and evil are, are huge themes in um, children's lives. And they just need, I think, the tools to really understand how to process that and what they can do about it. And I think feeling that sense of empowerment and that sense of being able to make a choice that can have a clear, positive action um, really can can get them past that, those sort of childhood um you know, fears and and feelings of helplessness, which I think that attitude that that you're describing is really what gets, gets them, um, you know, they, they feel like a full person. Yeah. And one of the major concepts that drives my work with the children's world is, um, here in Western culture, um, we have this concept of childhood that is not shared throughout the world and is not shared throughout history. Um, You know, we have children's clothing and children's music and children's books. Um, These things didn't always exist throughout time. And you see in different cultures, kids at a very young age, at age four or six, are expected to look after their younger siblings. They're making jewelry in the marketplace. They're using machetes to open coconuts. Um, We treat children very delicately in the West. And I think we're actually hindering what they're capable of psychologically, emotionally, and physically um, by catering to that idea. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that's really interesting. And the the kids for their part, you know, they're not dumb. Like they can see that they're being patronized or pushed off to the side or told that they're, you know, not capable. I mean, how many toddlers have been obsessed with being able to touch knives, right? It's like this rite of passage. Like when can I be trusted enough with something dangerous, you know, and I think it's so interesting listening to what you're saying um, to kind of weave in this, the veganism concept and sort of how the adults play a role in this. Like um, we just posted 
uh, shared that New York Times article that recently came out on this, that we posted on the COP Facebook pages, which is where I saw it, about um, it's a non-vegan, like sort of opinion columnist saying that, uh, you know, don't make fun of vegans because they were right all along. Yeah. And I think one of his core points there is that, you know, vegans don't have a sense of pride or sort of assertiveness about it because there is this self-censoring that we're doing. And I think that is something that when it's, when it's mixed in with this, this sort of um, coddling culture or, or excessively protective culture of kids um, can really make it hard to, to kind of own and understand veganism. And that's something that I always try to, you know, avoid and really just, you know, when the kids ask a question, it's just, answer their question, <laughs> you know, give them, give them the, the truth. Yeah. I think the truth is always the most straightforward solution to any problem. It's time for another cute kid quote. So in, in reading your books, too, and, you know, again, Cheryl and I, and hopefully some, most of our listeners will have had opportunities to, to read the books to actual kids, um, the, it's amazing to me how you've um, tied together um, the serious messaging. I, I mean, like, again, the truth about what's taking place and what doesn't need to take place to animals uh, in terms of the, the messages for veganism. Um, and then and then it's um, it's just juxtaposed or it's it's complimented, if that's possible, with your absolutely um, incredibly whimsical, uh, odd characters, you know, you're, you're, the creatures that you create and the, the way your style is just so unique. Um, is there a story behind that? Is there some way that, that you know, Ruby Roth's, you know, un, un, absolutely uh, recognizable style came about? There is. And I think uh, I also have a line of um, my own personal artwork was mostly feminine and figurative. And a lot of people look mm -hmm. at both first and say, oh, it's so different. But to me, actually, the line work is the same. Stylistically, I, I push my children's um, shapes a little more. And that comes from working with kids and being a teacher in the classroom and watching how kids draw animals. They're very, very genius oh, yeah. at essentializing uh, an animal's shape that's so to interesting. very simple yep. geometric shapes like you know an alligator becomes a letter v flipped on its side and so there's a lot of yep. um, graphic angular um, shapes in my children's book work um, but actually that there, there is that as well in my adult personal work too yeah i'm looking at the cover right now of that's why we don't eat animals and the chickens themselves completely recognizable as chickens um, are basically a golf ball you know, with, with <laughs> legs. And yeah. it's so, it's yeah, right. It's so simple, uh, which is something I, I um, uh, point out when I teach cartooning to kids too, that, you know, everything you draw, you can draw with three shapes, a circle square and a, and a triangle or some iteration of those three shapes. But the way you pull all of those together and the way that your, your style, again, um, is so fun to look at. It's so unique. Um, and then it's, it's got that messaging that's so, you know, for lack of a better term, serious, you know, it's, it's serious messaging in these children's books that I'm proud to read to my kids and they understand why it's, you know, what the story is, what's going on. Um, and I'm only hoping that other parents, um, who are either early vegans or, you know, uh, thinking about it, or just love animals, care about animals, um, are willing to uh, take a leap and get your books and read them. Well, to kids. I can tell you for sure that the movement is growing around the world um, just by marking um, countries that have picked up the titles for translations. 
Oh, so, yeah. you know, these yeah. books were somewhat controversial when they first came out. The publishers didn't know if there was going to be a market for them. Um, they were, it's a very risk averse industry and uh, yeah. they don't like to do things that are testing the waters. But, you know, I was adamant right. that there was already a market and the market was growing. And, you know, we may be a small niche, but it's a mighty niche and it is growing around the yeah. world. I think vegan is cool now. Yeah you know, especially among the younger generation. And that's happened really fast. Yeah. And even though we've spent, you know, however many decades laying the groundwork for it, I think we are, I have noticed at least just in my, you know, small little world that I'm in um, of non-vegans that I think it's, it's a lot more um, po immediately positive. You know, even when I say things like, Hey, we conduct undercover investigations and, you know, send people in and, and put the, like, blast the videos of the abuse everywhere. And people still are like, that's amazing. That's great. You know, I didn't get that kind yeah. of reaction back in the day. Well, it's and totally I think changed. I mean, when my first book came out in 2009, the publishers did not want me to write vegan on the cover. And by the wow. second book, which was 2012, they're like, okay, people are starting to search for this term. And... I know in my, in my life earlier in those years, um, I, I was still going to restaurants and having to explain what veganism is. And now it's, it's a household word. So as much urgency as we yeah, all have for yeah. things to like get better immediately, they're moving very quickly as far as the marketplace. Yeah. I've said it in a number of different episodes on this podcast too, that our kids um, are the cool kids now, which no one would actually believe until they see it themselves. But um, you know, both Cooper and Paisley are the ones who um, eat the cool foods, who, um, you know, are different in a good way. They stand out and they're both, you know, they're both dealing with their own challenges with, you know, as we all do with, with uh, vegan diets. Um, but they're, they're the cool kids and they're special. And that's completely different than, you know, a handful of years ago where it would have been met with such resistance or, you know, what do you mean? You know, what is vegan? Um, they're now the ones where, you know, parents at, in most cases, parents at parties that we're attending will accommodate yeah, our sure. kids. And it's really great when that happens. Like, hey, we made this for Cooper. We brought this for Paisley, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, well, this is, you know, this is great. Yeah. And so I think people also should remember that, like, while they're making fun of us, <laughs> um, that people are also listening. You know, like I remember seeing um, yeah. um, Applebee's. There was a, a commercial for Applebee's when they first started serving quinoa. And I was like, wow, you guys made – everybody makes so much fun <laughs> of quinoa for so long. And, like, now we have this this small army of experts – who understand why we're eating what we're eating and all of the noise that we've made over the years affects the marketplace. Yeah. Without a doubt. Well, I think Whether the they adults, like it or not. <laughs> yeah. The adults might be, you know, feel all that sort of negative pressure in a different way. The kids may not be feeling that at all. And I think that's something I remind myself of a lot, or if they do, it's very minor because, you know, we think about all that pushback that we were getting, you know, even 10 years ago, five years ago. And, you know, the, the, the kids weren't even born <laughs> at that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, they're getting That's a lot true. of positive reaction. So as much as the New York Times, you know, talks about, um, you know, vegans not feeling confident enough to sort of own their veganism, um, I think that's really applies to adults. And so as parents, I think we have to be careful not to impose that baggage on the kids um, because the world is changing very quickly and the kids may just have, you know, in their way, that sort of front and center kind of, you know, innocent and direct connection with these core values, which is one thing I really appreciate about, appreciate about your books, because it, keep, it distills those values concepts and presents them in very simple ways, but very kind of straightforward, vegan centric um, concepts. There's no dancing around things and there's no um yeah you know sort of uh playing to a big tent audience you know you're not you're not worried about um the the straightforward it, take that you're you're actually taking a position it, ruby i'm sure you're well aware of the video that's been shared 
probably most often related to your work, and it's the one of the the newscast where you're being interviewed on the yeah. On some news there channel. are a couple. I'm assuming it was California. There's like the K, there was KTLA yeah. that was actually on the Today Show, and there was a Fox one too. Yeah, and there, there's one where you're where the the newscaster is basically saying to you, "Aren't you making it more difficult?" For parents to get their kids to eat their food like you're telling them things that is making it so that they're not going to want to eat their food because of course they're considering food to be you know their animals are food but um i, I love how you you are so uh incredibly uh intelligent in your response and just you stick your ground and you dig your heels in it in such a way that there's no arguing the fact that you know Yes, read this to your kids. This is exactly yeah. what we're telling well, you. Like, don't have them yeah, eat animals. I, I tackle the brainwashing issue, um, you know, by saying that it's impossible to brainwash a kid with this book. They're getting hit with um, the normalization yeah. of meat and dairy all day long. So, you know, it, we're not in a yeah, vacuum. Yeah. They're hearing both sides. And one of the main tenets in my book all of them are that you decide you here's the information and it takes courage to um, decide what kind of person you want to be and stand up for yourself. And only you can do that. And our choices are powerful. So I've, I've always wanted kids to just have the information to start forming their own morals and values. This isn't a brainwashing mission. And also the, the pyramid yeah, yep. is expansive. It's diet, dietarily expansive. Um, when we transition from something that we normally know into something new, there's a learning curve and things to learn. Um, but when you do that and with pretty much any vegan educational resource, you learn about the things that most Americans are deficient in and you start addressing those deficiencies. Yeah, and kids don't have to do the deprogramming like we do, right? So, you know, it's an easier situation that they're in but you know what I really like about what you said too is it goes back to what we were talking about earlier with you know kids are not dumb like they can process this information and yeah. really you know see how it resonates with the way they think and the way they feel and make their own choices um, because I think the the concern the people who are sort of giving the pushback and raising these concerns is that kids are these sort of you know empty vessels with you know weak <laughs> weak uh tools to try to resist any kind of, you know, um, nefarious ideas that might be implanted in their heads. And that's just such a disrespectful way to think about all human beings, um, especially children who, you know, probably spend more time learning new things and dealing with the challenges of not being as competent as they would like be it, to be at any given skill. And, you know, that's the world they live in is just constant novelty and learning and figuring things out. And I think giving them that credit for being able to do that is really important. And also the battleground that's out there is not neutral. Like these companies are intentionally with organized marketing departments targeting children and skewing the truth. And I think it's important to teach kids how to read between the lines and what advertising is and what marketing is. I remember, you know, my former stepdaughter, like, looking at big billboards like for Chick-fil-A or, you know, whatever, where there's these happy cows or happy cow cheese or whatever. And saying like, look at, look at what, let me, let's talk about this and what they're trying to do and what's beneath this. And it becomes a, a game yeah. and they can start decoding slick marketing. Um, and yeah, I think ultimately building a stronger person who's going to make better decisions in their life and become more of a critical thinker. The The motto of all my children's books is, Love deeply, think critically, act responsibly, and that's a through line in, in all of them. That's that's wonderful. So Bad Day comes out this month, September 2019. Um, you have an event this month, is that right? What's coming up? What's in the in the uh, what's in so the offering this for Ruby Rock? Book launch. It's the launch of the fifth book, but it is also the 10 year anniversary of the release of That's Why We Don't oh, Eat yeah. Animals. So. I decided for the launch party here in LA, I'm going to have a 10 year anniversary gallery show. I have 40 plus original drawings wow. and paintings that no one has seen in real life that will be on display and I'll have a little pop-up merch shop. It's a one night only event. Um, it's uh, the RSVP and event details are up on my website. 
um, you can go to wedonteatanimals.com and it'll direct you there. It's in the navigation, but if anyone's around in LA, uh, definitely RSVP and come through. What neighborhood? It'll be in Hollywood. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. So I did mention, uh, we, we talked about Ruby in our most recent, or one of our most recent episodes as the illustrator behind the Good Kid Project, um, Nick Coughlin's yeah. wonderful set of uh, cards, story cards. Um, and tell us how that happened and um, what's he going on He reached out that. to me and um, said that he and his mom were working on this project. And um, I took a peek at the writing and I thought the writing was just really cute and clever and, and creative. Yeah. And um, I liked that there was some room left for kids to, you know, um, put two and two together. It was, you know, very, they're very short little stories that, um, yeah, yeah, yep. that make the kids think. Us, yeah. And, um, I just really liked it and I could picture the characters right away and, uh, we just decided to do that together. That's awesome. Well, looking forward to that. And also I mentioned in that episode, um, I'm not sure if you still do this, but your I do. <laughs> um, pet portrait during the, oh my gosh. So somehow I think on Instagram, I mean, to me, again, I'm, I'm totally fanboying here really hard because I love your work so much. I always have, and I love your style and uh, consider myself, you know, a Ruby Roth fan. So when I saw that you were doing this, our little dog, Kimchi, um, I had to do it. I mean, to me, there's no question. So Cheryl... Uh, Ruby offers. I mean, I'll let you explain. It's a, what this I do is. custom pet portraits. It's like a fun little side gig that started happening, and um, they're in my shop too. So you order a custom pet portrait, and you send me a handful of photos, and I kind of create this little character. Um, some people, some people add text, so cute. and uh, they're just quick little caricatures. Um, but it's really fun for me. Often people yeah. send me a little story about the rescue or what the pet has been through. Um, and they're just really sweet tributes to that, to for people's own pets and for friends and for pets who have died. Yeah. That itself could be another ah. book, by the way, if you're looking for yeah. something that's just turnkey. Because, as you say, there's story behind each of these, these animals that people love and care for. And the fact they find you and the fact that your book, you know, relates so much to animal rights and to veganism... Um, it all just ties together for us. This you know little portrait you did of kimchi is like it's cherished forever. And as you say, it's a caricature, so it's like it's a cartoon yeah, like, the of kimchi, are a little which is, is much better than. I like to try to capture exactly, some spirit yeah. and exaggerate it a bit. Yeah, they're really wonderful. I highly recommend that. I I can't recommend enough anyone and everyone getting as many Ruby Roth books in your library as possible. While we sat here, I got to tell you again, so proud of her. Uh, my little four-year-old uh, was looking at little thumbnails of each of your book covers, Ruby, and she navigated her way around through the entire house, four different <laughs> bookshelves, and retrieved all of the books that we own, which is all of them except awesome. for Bad Day Now. So she's so proud of herself because she would show the cover and say, all it's right, the same, it's the same. Give her a big high five for me. So, all right, I will do that. Um, yeah, this has just been wonderful. Um, Cheryl, I don't know if you have anything else you want to uh, ask or talk to Ruby about, but I, yeah, I, I love I think, this episode. Um, what I'm really curious about is, you know, obviously this is this is a major way that kids and parents maybe get their first real engagement with veganism. Um, what are some of the yeah. things that you've maybe been surprised by or touched by or thought were funny um, in terms of, how do people react? What do they say to you? What kind of stories do they tell? Um, what kind of challenges are they facing? What kind of wisdom have you gleaned from, um, you know, bringing this into people's worlds? My favorite story was in the very, very beginning. Um, it was around the time I was developing. That's why we don't eat animals. And I was still in touch with my students at the school. So I was kind of testing ideas and, um, once the book was done, I, I brought it back to them and read them the finished book. And there was a fourth grade girl who raised her hand and she said, referring to factory farming, she said, this sounds like slavery. And so I guess that they had been studying, you know, in the history portion of the classroom um, lessons, uh, had been studying slavery. And 
you know, this was just, she, she was putting two and two together and making connections. And um, I just thought it was quite insightful. And I get a lot of photos yeah. from families around the world of kids who get involved with protests or uh, wanting to do book reports. Um, but these are all kids who are, it's, it's really wonderful to see kids who starting to form their own morals and values and being brave enough to stand up for them. Yeah, I think I've said this before on the podcast, but that's maybe my favorite part that of, that's sort of unexpected about raising vegan kids and being around kids who are vegan and surprisingly um, more and more of them <laughs> um, just around um, is that it's really a window into um, developing ethical reasoning and other issues. So there can be some really big issues that these kids can have some very insightful and immediate reactions that they're really able to articulate. And I'm especially noticing in my five-year-old recently that his ability to just describe his own feelings is better. Um, you know, and I think that is heavily related to his engagement on these sorts of topics. And it doesn't just spill over into other animal issues, but into, you know, other big topics like, you know, like war or your story about slavery. I often tell people that I think that a, a vegan education goes far beyond um, practical health and food. Um, this is an initiation that's otherwise absent in our culture that says, kids, you are part of a local and global and environmental community. And you have responsibility to that community and we're watching you and we expect you to rise to the occasion. So I think these kinds of critical thinking prompts um, really bleed over into all parts of a kid's life. And then that's why I'm excited also about yeah. bringing bad day into the mix as well, because, you know, this is about um, our emotional intelligence and how we behave in the world and how, we react to the world as well, which has a, a, a lot to do with young vegan activist kids who are, you know, might be upset about how the world is functioning. And as good ambassadors and, and people who are at peace inside of themselves, with, with, despite what's going, outside, what's going on in the outside world, um, we need to have the skills to be able to manage and process our inner emotions. That's a, a wonderful place to uh, close this episode, I think. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure, as always, Ruby, to, to talk with you and to learn more about your uh, books and the upcoming book and just all of how you approach um, your projects. So you can find out more at wedonteatanimals.com. Um, the books are available, of course, on Amazon and wherever fantastically wonderful books are sold. Um, this has been great. I want to thank you for taking the time out and uh, thank look you forward both. to bad day. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. And as always, please send your comments, questions, concerns, funny anecdotes, and uh, cute kid quotes. And we will feature them on a future episode. Yes. Reach out to us. You can email us at veganfamily at triveg.com and uh, be sure to click subscribe on whatever podcast platform you check these podcasts out on and again thank you ruby thank you cheryl and uh thank you, i will see you in the next Bye. episode thank you for tuning in to animal outlook's vegan family podcast have episode ideas or questions about going vegan email us at go vegan at triveg.com